Hi, uh, thank you for coming to the first uh, seminar of the year. It's, uh, first of all, I, I should apologize for uh, the misunderstanding on the timing. I apologize, it's my fault. Uh, I thought it was at 1 p.m., but uh, obviously the, what went out was 1.30 p.m. Uh, so, at any rate, without further ado, uh, it's a pleasure to have here Dr. Barishnikov from uh, Bell Labs. Dr. Pereshnikov uh, is a department head at Bell Laboratories in uh, New Jersey. Uh, he joined there in 2001. He got his degree from uh, the Institute of Control Sciences in Moscow in 86 and has held uh, several faculty positions in uh, both uh, uh, Russia, uh, the Netherlands, as well as in France before coming to the US. He's been doing uh, extremely interesting work uh, since he's been in the U.S. and before then too, but I knew mostly about his work in the U.S. So, and uh, it's a pleasure to have him here, and uh, he's also a collaborator, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Hamid. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, so, uh, so this story is uh, about sensor networks, about self-organizing sensor networks. Uh, and you know, as probably everybody knows, sensor networks is uh, uh, carries huge promises of um, completely changing our ways of learning about the environment, learning about the uh, the surrounding world. Uh, there will be, you know, a lot of those sensors will be cheap, abundant, will be else, you know, everywhere. And you know, the main problem. Uh, you know, the main problem around such new new generation, new type of sensor networks is, of course, to, uh, you know, not to uh, kind of, finally, at some, at some point, we'll be able uh, to make them talk to each other and, you know, actually send information, gather information in such a way that it's sustainable. And then it will, uh, the problem will be, uh, okay, what we do with this information, how we actually organize these sensors, how we make them, you know, working in, uh, in a concert and in kind of coherent way. Uh, w w one, of the, one of the aspects, one of the sides of this overall problem is uh, uh, the problem of deployments of sensor networks. So again, if devices are cheap, then uh, the cost of deployment, the cost of actually putting a sensor somewhere, turning it on and uh, making sure that it's working will become you know, dramatic compared to the cost of the device. So if the device costs hundred dollar and sending a person, you know, a, you know, a human to, to deploy it will cost ten dollars, then definitely would like to, uh, you know, to, to save on the deployment costs. So probably will just over deploy. You know, uh, send, uh, spread much more sensors than you need to, and then turn them on and off as as required. So, uh, but if you do that, uh, you cannot just throw the sensors and ask you, you know. You know, just leave leave them there because they will, you know, either all will be, will be all working or all not working. So you need to make them work, turn them on and off uh, in some reasonable, some uh, sensible way. So this is uh, kind of a big problem. The uh, in sensor networking literature, it's known as kind of this the 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 the, the, uh, the, the overall umbrella title is called uh, wake uh, sleep wake protocols. But you know, typically people spend a lot of time just implementing various protocols, making the sensor sort of uh, communicating to each other and, you know, saying, okay, I'm asleep, I'm awake, and making it some coordinated way. Imagine again, we've passed this stage, what can we do? Imagine we have this, a lot of these sensors, wide area network, what can we do with them? So in this talk, I will be uh, mostly, mostly trying to uh, mm, look at what we can do with such, uh, you know, self-organizing, you know, S sensors which turn themselves on and off uh, to form barriers. Right. So again, one of the big uh, questions in uh, sensor network, in application of sensor network, is uh, intrusion detection or just detection. So you have, imagine, wide area network. So there's a lot of small sensor nodes sitting there, and they just want to detect presence of something, something which is uh, of interest to you. It might be, you know, some enemy trying to, to cross the border or some animal trying to run through the forest, which you want to, you know, detect that it's there. So, you know, just intrusion detection. So we want to create a barrier 
uh, in the sense that you know whichever whenever you you know some body of interest some object of interest crosses this area you know that right? so what are the ways to do so of course you can turn all the sensors on and you know then something happens you know something happens and then you can do something about it or you can try to form a barrier right so what's a barrier a barrier is a collection of sense you know we, we call you know we can think about the uh, big big domain like in planar domain M most of the talk will be dealing with the planar uh, networks uh, so think about the planar domain some some area you want to uh, control and it has two uh, sides you know outer side which is red on this graph and inner side which is blue on this graph if you want to uh, check that somebody is going from red to, to blue right so crosses this domain right? so to do th to do so of course you can sense the whole domain you can put the sensor so that all points of this domain are covered are sensed right? alternatively you can create a barrier a barrier is a subset such that no path which is starting here and ending there can avoid this barrier right? so obviously what is depicted here is not a barrier because you know you can create a path and many paths which avoid all of them right? so imagine that intelligent animal or uh, just sensing which sensors are on and off can find its way and completely avoid detection right? on the other hand this is this is a barrier right so the animal which moves entirely within this domain uh, cannot avoid it so in the literature, it's called sometimes strong barrier because the people uh, think about weak barrier. Something you know, if if you, if you have a model for the movement, for example, if you know that your animal is moving always straight, then <coughs> you can uh, sort of use this strategic information, placing the sensor strategically, so that each straight line, for example, will be intercepted. Uh, if you don't have any model information uh, about the path, about the trajectory, outside of the fact that trajectory is continuous, right? So then you have this notion of strong barrier. The strong barrier, once again, it's the subset, the union of the sensing areas is a strong barrier. If it uh, meets any trajectory which starts at the outside boundary and ends at the inside boundary. Right. This is, of course, just uh, you know, it's a topological notion. Right. So it's, uh, it's some statement about this uh, topology of this set, you know, this separating it. Right. It means that uh, you can formulate it in topological uh, terms, but uh, I won't do it. Just uh, it's very robust notion, right? The, 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 the being a strong barrier is notion which is, in some sense, <coughs> depending only on the overlapping of sensing areas, not on the geometry of this. Okay, so we have redundant uh, set of sensors, and we want to build barriers. How we can do it? Okay, so this is you know like the model I would like you to have in mind. So this is our domain. This is our sensing area. So this is each each circle. Again, it's not necessarily should be a circle. It might be some sense, you know, area which you sense. Right, so each sensor can sense some area, and you want to create a barrier using these uh, sensors, turning some of them on and off. Uh, and probably you want to do it in such a way that you know all sensors are being turned on and off in some proportional time, so they they share the load. So it's not that you know you just turn some sensors on. You create a barrier and then you know just let these sensors uh, carry all the load. You want to do it in, in turns, <coughs> and there is of course an obvious solution, right? It's just uh, so this is you know it's kind of completely stupid solution. It's just turn them at random, right? Some fraction at random. They probably won't form a barrier, or you have to over provide. If you have indeed to form a barrier, you have to put the sensors over some percolation limit, so which is kind of forces you to, to, to have some density of sensors which are turned on if you want to form a barrier. So this is not very efficient way. More smart way is to uh, form these uh, virtual barriers. Uh, smart way is to form this. Uh, virtual barrier is something like that. And you can essentially uh, eventually uh, send these waves towards from uh, inner boundary towards the outer boundary, something like that. right? So this would be a, uh, a natural scheme to deploy. However, once again, if you think about it, how you would like to implement it, to implement the scheme uh, efficiently, you, you, you will have uh, de facto know for each sensors the distance towards to, to, the, to the inner boundary. Essentially, for any sensors, you will, know, you will have to know its geographic position. 
And uh, knowing geographic positions for sensors is expensive. It's expensive in terms of energy if you provide them, you know, or you know, equipment if you, you know, give them GPS or put some, uh, some, uh, uh, yes. So, how do you define exactly a barrier in terms of uh, the tightness? The tightness of your uh, uh, the barrier. So we call is it is it a coverage thing? Uh, no, no, the, the barrier was defined. Uh, remember, the, the barrier was defined as the. Uh, Disaster. So barrier was defined as subset such that no, uh, so there is no uh, path going from outside to inside, no continuous path connecting so inside. So as long as there is a, a little bit of uh, overlap then the, in the coverage, then it's okay. Well, there in is terms of the sensors, there, there is some overlap in the coverage here, but it's not enough. You have you have to have a, you know it's topological notions. If you right. Look. Right. So what you have to have is essentially a path. Connect, you know, kind of. You can formulate in terms of, you know, of, of a path connecting the, uh, okay. you know, the, the the vertical boundaries in some sense. I, I don't want to go into details here. You can formulate it, but yeah. So overlap should be rich enough, but it doesn't mean you have to cover all the area, right? So it should be some uh, con conne connected connected Connect pieces down. connected pieces. Yeah, connecting uh, s sideways. And as a, uh, as we saw, such kind of, you know. You, you can reach it by saturating the substrate, you know, turning on very many sensors at random. It can be reached if you above some percolation threshold for geometric percolation. Or you can do it using these uh, waves, right? But waves require organization. Waves require knowing exactly where the sensors are. Right? So you turn, you know, like first the sensor on the sensors, which are a distance one foot from the boundary, two feet from the boundary, and so on and so forth. And in this sense, of course, you are you are fine because you know nobody can intrude, and you know if somebody is there, if you will be forced outside. Uh, however, it requires a lot of overhead. So we want to we want to do something self-organizing, right? Something which is used only in communication between the sensors and without much overhead from us. Okay, how we can do it? So this work is about a new protocol which is completely localized. It's uh, uh, each uh, node is, has very simple sort of the state, the state space of each node is extraordinarily simple. It's uh, scalable. You know, you can you can see how scalable this is. Very full, full tolerant. It's, I'll show you simulations. Uh, it does separation and uh, essentially all these properties. You don't need to engineer for all these properties. They are coming all together for more or less for free. So this is uh, uh, the construction is based on the theory of uh, some models of cellular automata. So just to remind you, uh, some of you maybe know, some of you don't, in the, in the 70s, uh, the area of cellular automata kind of burst into life with uh, Conway game of life. So it's very simple uh, cellular automaton with uh, two states, 0 and 1. So this is a ones, the blacks are zeros, and you know, the picture is suggesting Indeed, it's coming from all these computers, you know, all these early computers from 70s. It's what was, you know, we were looking at. So each uh, site will be alive if it has some given number of neighbors between three and five. It will die if it will has less than two neighbors or more than five neighbors. And will be born if it has exactly, uh, you know, three or four neighbors. So this very simple uh, model, so you, when you can survive, when a new, new guy will be born, or when the guys will be dying. And you know, this it kind of they demonstrated that you can generate very rich structure. For example, this uh, guy, it's sort of mothership, generates all these small ships which are kind of flowing in this direction. So this rich, uh, rich cellular automaton with very simple rules. Our rules are, however, even simpler. Uh, and they're based on so-called uh, cyclic automata. So what is a cyclic automata? Cyclic automata are automata which each node, right? So we're talking about one node. So each node has state space, which is just a cycle. Meaning that your state is changing only in one direction along this cycle. So from each state, you either stay in this state, or you can jump to the next state. That's the only thing which can happen to you. And we'll be talking about local cyclic automata. Cyclic automata when the jump happens only based on your state and the states of your neighbors. Right. So this is cyclic cellular automata. Is, uh, the mechanism we like to address, right? And uh, again, this this were studied by mathematicians trying to model various uh, phenomena. And we're looking at the model which is called Greenberg-Hastings uh, model. So Greenberg-Hastings model 
is the model on the plane, on the integer lattice on the plane. So in each integer point on the plane, so each point of the integer with the integer coordinates, just a square grid, right? on each uh, side of the square grid, you have such a cycle. Right? So how this uh, greenberg harsing uh, automaton operates? It's very simple. So, uh, so this cycle is called, this state is called 0, then it's called 1, 2, 3, 4, and altogether you have k states. So states vary from 0 to k minus 1, right? this counterclockwise uh, fashion. So what happens? So if your state is not the last state, so this is k minus 1. So if in, for any state but the last state, let's call this last state, right? So for any state which is the last state, you know, with all states with the exception of the last state, for the next time, so this kind of, sorry, uh, first of all, the time is discretized. So the time is following some discrete instances. It's not continuous time model, it's discrete time model. In all serial automata we will be talking about a, a, a discrete time model, uh, automata. So for any state but the last one, uh, in the next time instance, you just jump to the next state. So if you're here, you jump there. If you're here, you jump there. Don't pay any attention to what happens elsewhere. You just go ahead. Obviously, it requires extraordinarily little of computing overhead. It requires absolutely zero activity on site. You don't listen to anything. You don't you know, tell anybody anything. You just go ahead. If you're in the last state, right? You stay there until at least one of your neighbors, so you have some neighbors. So you wait in this last, last state, you wait until one of your neighbors has color zero. So you wait until one of your neighbors is in state zero. And once that happens, then in the next time instant you jump yourself. So obviously the dynamics depends on what, who are your neighbors, right? So this is just you know short si simulation of this automaton. So these guys are marching ahead, right? Both of them. This is something also happening there. This guy doesn't have any neighbors in state zero, so this guy will stay. This guy is still marching ahead, right? Now both of them stay. Now suddenly this guy, you know, somehow happened to, st to turn into state zero, and it sends the signal to its neighbors, right? So this guy is neighbor to this guy. So the next stage, this guy goes ahead. This guy jumps to state zero because in the past state he got the signal, and now he sends signal to this guy, right? So and how it's propagated. So this is how the short simulation of our uh, uh, greenberg hastings model for this three-state automaton, uh, three nodes automaton. So this n number of states here is eight, right? Because the cycle has eight colors. We call the number of uh, number of states in the, in the machine, the colors. And then there are three nodes. So this is a very simple model. Uh, so nodes are synchronized. And uh, again, so le let's re re kind of register once again. So in all states, uh, but this one, we are deaf. We are deaf, don't listen to whatever happens outside. We don't pay any attention. We just march ahead. And in this state, in the zero state, uh, we just shout something. Right? So this is the stage of activity. You jump to this state, you send a signal to your neighbor, shout, that, you know, saying, OK, I'm in state zero. Maybe you also gather some information. Maybe you also communicate with the central station. You know, all other states, nothing, else hap nothing happens. OK, so let's look at the, at the pictures. Let's look at what happens in this uh, two-dimensional Greenberg uh, uh, greenberg hastings model. So this is a uh, fragment of this big lattice. Actually, it's a toral. It's, I think it's a tor torus. Uh, so the big lattice, there are 12 colors. Right? So that each, for each node, you have this cycle with 12 colors. And let's see what happens. So this is, you start with a random configuration, and then you let the machine run. It's very easy to program. You know, every, you know, I really advise you to, you know, just to do it on your uh, computers. It's really easy to program it. You get some nice pictures. So this is what happens after 50 states. You see some structure emerges. So some big plateaus of same color happen. Right? So how, you know, how this plateau form? It's rather obvious. You know, the guys are moving ahead and hit this last 11th state 
and get stuck there because now there is no neighbors which can move them, right? So this we have formed these big plateaus, and then suddenly this plateau gets moved moved ahead because you know some some guy gets zeros and you know the, all of them jump uh, jump ahead. So this is after 90 steps. The structure becomes more and more pronounced. And this is uh, after 150 states, uh, steps. So what's, uh, what we see here? You see quite obviously that we have the spirals. Right? The structure of spirals is pretty obvious. So there's some spirals are being uh, generated, some random spiral waves. Right? So if you look at the machine, you can see that indeed they will be s spirals will be sort of evolving, going from these uh, nucleation centers. So uh, this is characterization. This, this feature is completely characteristic of this uh, cyclic cellular automata. So first of all, the uh, the shape of the spirals, uh, the shape of the spirals is uh, uh, modulated by by the geometry of, of the neighbor of the neighbors, right? So we have we consider the neighboring uh, states being just the states separated by uh, by one by one link in this uh, two-dimensional grid. So it means that the unit. So the, the unit uh, uh, ball, the unit disk, you know, the, the set of distance, this Manhattan, so-called Manhattan distance, well, the, the unit disks are just the rhombi, the diamonds, right? So you have these spiral waves are sort of formed by these diamonds. So these waves are not circular approximately, but approximately looking like diamonds. Uh, okay, so this is experimental uh, uh, result, and uh, you know, it's, um, I understand when you start off in the random state that right. some of them will be zeros. Right. But after the first discrete time, it seems like there'll never be any more zeros. Why? So how? The zeros will, will have some neighbors. The zeros will have some neighbors, and you know they probably propagate. Of course, there is a chance. You're absolutely right. There is a chance. There's some probability for any finite configuration. There's some probability. It's you know rather rather elaborate mathematical theory for these uh, lattice models, right? For any finite uh, state, there is some probability that you just stuck in you know state where everybody sits in eleventh in state and you know num number k minus one, so you have this plateau. The, the thing degenerates. However, the probability of this, if you have very large graph, is relatively small, and I will explain why. Okay, so uh, just you know to notice that this dynamics. Of Kind of mo most of the literature is dealing with this uh, uh, latest dynamics, two dimensional latest dynamics, because it's easy to model, you know, play with on computer, easy to observe what's happening, easy to produce conjectures and prove them. However, it can define this Greenberg Hastings uh, dynamics on any graph, right? So the only thing we are using is the notion of neighbors. You have some neighbors, you know who is talking to you, and you just run these dynamics. Okay, so yes. Adjacent? Adjacent neighbors, right. So that's uh, I what I mentioned, that adjacent neighbors means that unit, uh, unit disk uh, is the Manhattan, you know, this diamond. If there were sort of the, I forgot the, the names, if you have kind of diagonal neighbors yeah. were counted as well, you will have the also spiral waves that will sort of the square, you know, the squares with axis parallel to the, to the coordinate axis, with size parallel to the coordinate axis. Okay, so what happens? How the spirals being born, to answer your question, right? So. Uh, we call a seed. A seed is just a collection of uh, cyclically connected nodes in, in consecutive states. Right? So like in this picture, uh, this will be a seed. So if you just, you know, I colored them by more or less by, uh, by the initial rainbow uh, progression. So this will be a seed. So like uh, from, you know, from, 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 from deep blue through, through green to, to, to red, or from, from violet through blue to green to red, right? So you have this uh, progression of colors, and they're all connected to each other, right? So you have a cycle, so the guys are connected to each other, they have a cycle, and they're in the right cyclic position in these states. So if you have such a cycle, what will happen to the cycle? A moment reflection will be happening that, you know, the, the states in the cycle will just be marching along the cycle. There is no absolutely way to, to, to kick them off this, this march, right? Because everybody but the last one, right? Will be, uh, sorry, the, 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 the penultimate one will be marching ahead, and the penultimate one will also always have a neighbor which will be turned into red one, right? And so on and so forth. So a seed, a cycle, which are in right cyclic order, will always survive. 
it will be here for, for, for eternity. And it will generate the waves because the zero state will be going around and you know whoever is stuck around you, it will be turned to zero and it will be propagating. So this is the mechanism how the spirals, the spiral waves are being generated. So if you start with a random guy, completely random guy, somewhere just by, again, with some prob high probability, there will be some, some of this uh, collection that is seed, right? And the seed will generate a spiral wave. Of course, there is a problem with it, right? So once again, this is completely autonomous dynamic in the seed, and they generate the spiral waves. So the problem is that, uh, again, it's quite quick computation. Uh, you think about it, if you have large number of states, Right. The density of such uh, seeds is decreasing exponentially with the number of states. Right. So it takes you know quite a while to find these seeds. So if you have very large uh, kind of if you want to do something complicated, then you know these seeds will be very far away from each other. Okay. So before we address this uh, problem, potential problem, uh, there's another problem, right? All these models which we have studied before, the greenberg hastings model, we're addressing the uh, lattice, right? The, the nodes we're sitting on the lattice. And in real life, you, you're throwing your sensors, they are placed randomly. Right? So you're looking at the randomly placed sensors in the, uh, on the plane, right? So you have just a random subset, just a Poisson point process, if you like, or just randomly scattered a large number of, uh, of points there. So what happens there? You know, approximately the same thing. So we start with some nodes. Uh, so they are randomly placed. Maybe not looking, you know, they're not on the lattice. It's just discretization effort uh, because you put some squares around them. And you run these dynamics. So this is what happens now. The first steps, you know, you see most of them are sort of in this, uh, uh, there are some empty, sp empty spaces which are, uh, I think, which are black. And white spaces are this, you know, where you're stuck, where you're waiting until something will happen, right? So this is exactly what happens in these big places where nothing. So, uh, but you have, luckily, we have some nucleation seeds, obviously, right? These nucleation seeds, uh, you know, generate these uh, waves. And now the waves are circular because uh, the problem is com completely isotropic. So essentially, your spiral waves, the spiral waves you're generating, something like that, uh, have a circular shape now. It's approximately circular shape, but it's circular. Okay, so this is what happens. And uh, once again, let's uh, let's look at this thing. So le let's try to think about it. Uh, let's return to original problem, which we you know kind of addressed. We want to sensors. We want to them to uh, being sleep or awake, and we want to self-organize in some reasonable way, in such a way that they form some natural barrier, some some structures we separate some pieces for, from one another. It's natural that you know we have this marching and you know there is some sort of some numbering some numbering states where you just march ahead on this you know internal state without paying attention to what happens outside of you. And this is active state where you're shouting something. Maybe in this state you not only shout but you're looking around you what happens there, right? So maybe you're just sensing what happens. So let's consider the uh, this node zero, actually it doesn't matter that it necessarily should be node zero, just for, uh, uh, for definitiveness sake. Uh, consider the node zero being the, the, the node where you sense something, right? So let's mark not only scholars, but just mark the nodes which are you know, at state zero and see what happens. And we see that nodes in state zero indeed form, again, it's just, just the points nodes. So each of them is surrounded by the sensing disk. Right. So if you surround each of them by sensing disk, you will see they form some connecting, uh, connected barriers. Right. So it is uh, you know, pretty reasonable to expect that some, this, some cell, this self-organizing structure will form these barriers which will separate the substrate. So intruder cannot move ROM completely freely. Of course, the intruder can move some, something like that. Right. But at least it's not completely complete free movement. Right. Out? Yeah, yeah. Again, it's, it's just the state zero. If remember that everything is cyclic. So these waves, kind of, these other colors here, and each colors are. One can prove. One can prove that after a while, the uh, uh, you know, if you have a, if you don't deteriorate, then you you have this cyclic cyclic behavior. So essentially, these waves are going, you know, cy cycle by cycle. Uh, oh yeah, actually, this is this is the dynamics. 
Let me go back. So this is where I start, 2004, uh, 204, 208, 212, 216, right? So we kind of just moving, re being always regenerated. So we do form these continuous lines, and you know the distance between those lines is depending on the density of nodes. It, you know, you can again write down rather easily the you know the, the, in the terms of uh, uh, parameters of the problem is the density of the nodes, the communication distance, number of colors. In terms of these three parameters, you can <coughs> very easily compute the uh, average distance uh, separation between those active waves. Uh, and you can prove that the uh, these active waves, that if you connect all these active waves by the uh, uh, communicating, uh, you know, can, can, can connect all these uh, all these black dots with the links if they are communicating, then what you get is connected connected barrier. So all barriers are connected. You can prove it. Okay. So it is a barrier in the sense that uh, the if if the communication uh, distance r is. Uh, uh, is less, uh, no, not greater than the sensing distance, so you kind of you sense at least to the distance when you can communicate, then you, you, form, uh, you form a barrier. Okay, but you know, the disadvantage of the scheme, already it's sort of pretty reasonable scheme to start with, but you know, there are clear, clear, clear disadvantages. First of all, you are relying on the random mechanism of generating these seeds, right? You are relying that the seeds will be there or not, so you know, some chance, some random mechanism. Uh, so on one hand, on the other hand, these uh, barriers you, you don't control them. So what you should do, of course, you should plant the seeds, right? You, the, to plant a seed, you can do it in a controllable way because you have to plant one seed, and you know, and pretty far away in some some you, you can deploy somebody to to uh, you know this is ten you know ten to twenty thousand nodes, and if for these twenty thousand nodes you just plant two or three seeds artificially, strategically placed. Then it's not such a big overhead. You can you can afford it. So this is what happens. You know this random uh, this randomly generated spiral waves. And what if what happens if you just plant the seeds? You can guess probably that two seeds are planted here and there. You see some much much better picture, right? So remember that the waves are going in this direction. So essentially you are squeezing your intruder back from inside to the outside, right? So the barriers are being formed. And uh, so by seed, again, that kind of the one can do it in the poorest way. In the poorest way is to play, plant K, K, K nodes in cyclic order and communication distance to each other. Or you can, you know, you can forget about it and just plant one seed, which just cyclically forget, you know, some special seed, some special node, which cyclically changes its uh, states. Don't pay any attention. Every K, K instances, it shouts, don't doing anything else. This is artificial seed. Uh, so you can prove that uh, if the, in the high density limit, so if the density of these uh, 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 nodes is high, then these waves are following the uh, the function, which is just the distance to the seeds. So take the function, which is the distance to the seeds. So it will be function, which is the distance to this seed here, distance to that seed here. There will be some you know uh, separating uh, uh, border. So it will be some piecewise smooth function, the function which has some ridges, but you know, otherwise it will be just the distance, the piecewise smooth function. And the level sets of this function will be forming these barriers. Right. Okay, so what can you do else? You can actually double the complexity of your automaton. So automaton was extraordinarily simple. It was just one counter. You know, most of the time it was just sleeping, not doing anything. So you know what? One counter or two counters, it doesn't make any difference, right? You can put two counters which are operating independently. Right? What it gives to you? Well, unfortunately, this here is, uh, you know, some, some of them are red. This is one counter. Some of them are black. This is the other counter. So you have two counters, two seats, right? So you have essentially two copies. So each node now have two copies of the automaton. One of them is, uh, you know, walk, talking on the one frequency, another one on the other frequency. So you generate two, two, two such waves. What's the advantage of it? Advantage of it is not only the uh, intruder is being squeezed out. The intruder is now, if intruder indeed is intelligent enough, sees which sensors are on and off, and wants to avoid the detection, it's also caged. So intruder is being located in some cell you know, bounded by these uh, consecutive waves of two counters, right? and cannot escape it. 
unless, uh, unless detection is imminent. Actually, if you add a third clock, right, you can organize your, uh, you can organize your scheme in such a way that third clock, adding a third clock, will make all these uh, cells actually squeezing. So detection will be imminent. So there is absolutely no way for intruder to be uh, somewhere in the middle of this domain and not being detected. So this is pretty, uh, you know, this is very nice scheme. You know, we can uh, exploit it a lot and we can prove that it works. But, you know, we can ask uh, ourselves, okay, what happens in the real life? What happens if you allow for, uh, <coughs> you know, various faults? For example, the geometry of the substrate might be, you know, not, not completely ideal, right? There might be some lakes, buildings, what not, right? So holes. What happens then? Well. Turns out the protocol is completely robust. Once again, uh, we can prove that uh, the, the same result, the, the waves, the, f the waves which are formed, again, we have to two counter picture here. It's uh, not very well seen. Maybe here it's slightly better. So we have two, two, two coloring depends on, on, on two counters, so you can see the split into cells. So each wave for each of the counter follows the distance function to the seat. But now the distance is understood in, uh, sort of in the shortest, shortest pathway. It's not the, uh, the bird fly distance, right? So the distance from this point to the seat is the shortest path avoiding the, uh, avoiding the obstacle, right? So you'll see the wave is sort of uh, kind of have some uh, singularity here just because the shortest distance is longer at this point compared to the neighboring point, right? So, uh, but again, the same, the same result uh, is valid. So in, in case of high density, the waves converge to the level sets of uh, corresponding distances to, to the seats. And again, you have partition. Again, you have anything you, you, you would like to have. However, however complicated so your, your, uh, uh, the, the geometry of your domain is. Uh, similarly, uh, you can allow for failures of the nodes or failures of, I mean, failures of the nodes in some sense, uh, you know, if you assume that in your nodes are failing at some, uh, with some frequency, then it's more or less the same as to uh, kind of considering the, the process which is, uh, you know, Poisson with smaller density. So failures of the nodes are not, not that crucial. But you ask, what is it, what about the communication failures? So, you know, sometimes you can talk to your neighbor, sometimes not. Right. So uh, you can also, you know, create a model where your, your, your link is there or not for each, you know, for each new time when you shout, your neighbor, which is in communication distance, can hear you or not with some probability. Let's assume the probability uh, of failing or of failure is rather high, 30 percent. It's relatively high probability of failure. Still, you see that, uh, you know, the, the pretty nice, uh, link, you know, wave formation uh, occurs there. It is quite easy to understand why it happens. There are some, again, large, uh, essentially low of large number of works. And uh, it is not, it's not, not a surprising result. But uh, as, as all this, it's quite easy to prove a result that you know, shows that ideally everything works. And then you run simulation and see that indeed it to work, you need some to scale to extraordinary density or some very, very, large, uh, very large networks. And here we see that for very, uh, for very, uh, for rather moderate, for rather small, uh, small. Uh, I mean, it's about 10,000 nodes. Uh, for rather small densities, uh, you have the, um, <coughs> um, you you have pretty robust, pretty stable result. Okay, so uh, you you can also consider a situation when kind of sort of military. Uh, looking uh, situation when, say, the enemy drops uh, some bomb and takes you know, fraction of your sensors away. So you have no sensors. You have to redeploy them. You throw some new sensors and some new nodes in this place. So here, for example, you just took away some, some big pieces, big chunks, and then redeploy. So you reset. You take, take the network. Network is operating periodically. Everything is fine. <coughs> Then you take away some big chunks of it and reset everything to some zero state or some, you know, some fixed state. Right? What happens then? It turns out that uh, you know, extraordinarily fast, just after like f 
40, uh, 40 iteration after this, uh, after this thing happens, uh, you have uh, you have this uh, you have complete stabilization, complete uh, complete recovery uh, of the of the geometry of the wave fronts. So, uh, one might ask why you know this uh, degree of stability is uh, you know m m might be seem it's a little bit surprising, but you know the, the protocol is so uh, simple, so robust that uh, this you know if you uh, Kind of write the model. There is absolutely nothing which can happen there. The uh, and one one of the reason uh, reason for it is essentially the continuity of uh, you know continuity of these barriers. The fact that the uh, the fact that this uh, color becomes uh, the fact that the color of uh, of the state the, the the node becomes essentially just the distance to the seat is the uh, the key consideration and it's uh, it plays a role in all, in all the proofs. <coughs> So, uh, um, okay. Okay. So uh, let me just summarize. Uh, you know, approaching uh, to towards the end. Uh, so we have this uh, the, the new protocol, which is giving you the sleep awake uh, schedule for. Uh, Sleep sleep awake uh, scheduling uh, protocol for self organization in this uh, sensor networks and you know you can think about as wireless sensor networks but because the only uh, need to communicate is just to let your neighbors know in what state you are uh, that's uh, you know maybe other, other modes of communication it might be photonic or acoustic whatever whatever else you, you prefer so this kind of being wireless is is not necessary because you don't need uh, Essentially, you don't need even to identify your neighbors. You, the only thing you know, you have to know, is that somebody in your neighborhood just shouts, or somebody in the neighborhood just emitted some signal. You don't have to know who it is. You don't, no handshakes, no acknowledgement, nothing, uh, not, uh, no overhead in this, uh, in this uh, communication, <coughs> in establishing this, uh, this link uh, is requested. Uh, so. The genesis, as I mentioned, is uh, the cyclic cellular automata, and the cyclic cellular automata they uh, they have been exploited, you know, by, by many uh, folks uh, to model to model the uh, generation of uh, waves, to, to model the diffusion reaction uh, equations, uh, sorry, uh, reaction diffusion equations, and uh, similar kind of discret discretizing various uh, systems of uh, of self organization in nature. Uh, here is the first sort of first uh, uh, approach we know where this uh, set of ideas was applied in the area of sensor networking, self organization and sensor networking. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the protocol is extraordinarily robust, much more robust than we actually expected it to be in simulations. So uh, it's a node failure, link failure, substrate geometry, clo clock drift. Yeah, one more, uh, probably one more. Uh, useful uh, consideration is that, uh, as I mentioned, we uh, operate on the assumption that the time is completely discretized. So all the, uh, all the clocks are, you know, everything happens in, uh, on discrete time. Uh, one might ask that, you know, everybody knows that uh, clock synchronization in wireless sensor networks is a problem on itself, right? It, you know, to, to know that you, this, you know, that time, uh, ne network time uh, transfer protocol is uh, typically uh, Big, big mess. It, uh, it causes a lot of headache in, in real wireless sensor networks. Uh, in fact, we don't need it here. We don't need it com to, to be completely. We don't need to know that the time is the same in all nodes. What we need to know is there is no, uh, you know, big, big collision, big confusion. So the only thing you have to pay attention is that approximately you and your neighbors, you and your neighbors are observing approximately the same boundaries and intervals. So you don't kind of the, uh, the, the boundaries of your uh, time, time tacts shouldn't, shouldn't cross each other. That's the only thing you have to check. And essentially, you have to maintain the sanity checks with your neighbors. So once you shout, you, you, know, you give maybe some, some uh, very, very modest time synchronization just to indicate the beginning of the shout and the end of the shout so that your neighbors can adjust their, uh, their cycles in a corresponding way. And uh, just because the uh, uh, 
again, this is one, one step back in this uh, dynamics of this uh, uh, of this uh, cellular automata. Each each node has just one predecessor. So each node hears essentially from one of these predecessors, which you know sets says uh, that I'm in state zero. Now you can jump into state zero yourself. Right? So there is just one guy you have to listen to. There is no ca conflict. There is no collision. You know, p potential uh, potential conflict between different time uh, different clock setters. Uh, probably one more uh, uh, one more uh, note before uh, before I, I finish is uh, uh, that uh, essentially once you generated these waves, right? Once the geometry of the waves is set in the whole substrate, you can forget about it. You can forget about the protocol. All nodes. If they maintain the intervals, and if you know that the nodes are there, they are not taken away by some explosion or by some failure, they can just not listen to anybody. Just you know, run their clocks, right? They just you know, come to life periodically with you know every every k steps. The wave structure will be the barrier structure will be preserved. Right? Of course, you better do uh, once in a while. Uh, switch back to, to this uh, Greenberg-Hassing dynamics just to maintain the uh, maintain the uh, integrity of your wave of your barrier structure because otherwise again the failures the node failures or some sabotage action can uh, actually uh, uh, destroy it. But uh, if everything is if you know that your nodes are reliable and there is no uh, 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 adversary actions there, you can. Actually, once periodic, m m m uh, peri periodic dynamics established itself, you can switch the, uh, the Grimmie-Hastic dynamics off. Uh, OK, so efficiency of the sensing networks, uh, again, it may be uh, very high, because uh, the density of the sensors, which are actually on compared to the total deployment of the sensors, can be made arbitrarily low. So it's uh, re reciprocal to, uh, to the number of states. So if you increase the number of states, you can make this barrier com you know, arbitrarily thin compared to the whole substrate. So the barriers can be arbitrarily thin. It will be just separating the substrate. Uh, there's a lot of interesting math there, because all these uh, results which I was mentioning, they, you know, most of them are proved. Some of them require some more interesting math, some less interesting math. But all of them is uh, very interesting mathematical background. OK, thank you. Any questions? Yeah. So, uh, exactly when can the sensor sleep? Say again. Uh, you, you you said this is a, a sleep sleep awake protocol. Awake. Yeah. Schedule or, or protocol. Right. When are they allowed to sleep? We we interpret them as sleeping when they're in all states but the zero state. Well, you, you, you just you advance your clock, you know. In, in the sense that they still have to have the receiver on and listening. They have the receiver on in last state, and k, state k minus 1. No, no, in all the others. No. No? No. You don't pay any attention. You just march ahead. In all states, but if the, the, the k minus first, you march ahead. You came to the state k minus first, you turn your receiver on. You listen. Once you hear the shout, you jump to the active state. You shout <coughs> yourself. You got information. You transfer, tra transmit information, and then you again march again. So you're sleeping essentially. You're not doing anything but listening. I mean, you don't do anything in k minus two states. You're listening in one state, and you're doing something in one state. So you're sleeping most of the time. Again, you're maintaining the internal clock, and your the counter sort of is there. So you. But its uh, overhead is minimal. Right. But you, you don't even have to do that. Probably you can put a timer to wake you up after k minus two. Again? Uh, you, you don't even have to count, right? You just have to have a timer to wake you up after well, you k know, minus two. Well, computer, you know, right. if even computer is hibernating. You know, there is yeah. something, you know, there. So mm. you, you need to maintain some clock because otherwise you don't know the time is there, right? But so the clocks are synchronized. Yeah, the clocks are synchronized, but again, synchronization, as I mentioned, should should, should be local. You don't need, you know, in the different sides of the of the network, you don't need to know that it's the same time. What you need to know is that you, with your neighbors, you approximately, you know, approximately you, you, your your boundaries of your intervals don't overlap, uh, don't shift by by each other. 
and there is no danger of uh, of degenerating. I mean, no. No. So you can prove that there is no danger of degenerating. So if you, if you maintaining, if you allowing the shifts, but the shifts are such that you, you know, sort of the again, you have this interval, say, kind of this time intervals, so this my time interval, this is your time interval. Right. As long as you maintain that, that you know overlap is significant enough to exchange information, to, to hear the shouts and uh, to, to shout yourself, you're fine. <coughs> and uh, should the node in uh, state zero be shouting till the whole one interval or just happen? Pro probably, you know, the prob you know, there is some information to communicate. Probably in the beginning you say, you know, I'm start to shout and then you say I'm stop to shouting in the middle. Again, to, to maintain the, if you have the, 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 the problem with maintaining the time interval, the synchronization, the probably indicate what, you know, you, you shout several times uh, telling you, you know, what, what is the quantile of your shout, right? The first shout, first shout, you know, first, second out of five. And this information probably is good to, maybe just, you know, shouting your counts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, I'm dead. So. There is a minimum density, right? Uh, right, so about the density, uh, all, all this uh, the story was uh, done on the assumption that the uh, communication graph is uh, strongly connected. Uh, so, kind of, by, by, by so the density per se plays no role, so you have to talk about the communication radius compared to the density, right? So, yeah, you have to, to assume some, you know, some log square root, logarithmic square root uh, of logarithm overhead. The standard overhead for uh, you know for, <coughs> for for the coverage or for the like uh, the giant component for the connectivity of the communication graph or geometric graph. Roughly, how, how many neighbors? Uh, the what number is to break? Uh, the number of neighbors. So uh, the number of neighbors should uh, again, in principle, you can maintain a fixed number of neighbors. But you know, if you want to be completely theoretically clean, the number of neighbors should grow like the logarithm square root of the logarithm of the volume. The number of, of neighbors per per uh, per node should grow like the square root of logarithm of the of the size of your of your guy, which yeah. is slow slow growing function. If I understood, the algorithm is based on just coupling between nearest neighbors. Is that right? Yeah. So in most uh, physical, if you shouted with most physical phenomena, you would you would be heard by next nearest neighbors, third nearest neighbors, you know, that it would go out, uh, there wouldn't be a, a threshold with the, uh, with the range. What would happen to the dynamics if everybody within a radius uh, heard you, even if that went beyond your nearest neighbors? Oh, no, 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 That's, you define your neighbor as somebody who can hear you. That's the definition of neighbor. Your neighbor is somebody who can hear you. It's not, again, we, have, we are on the plane, the, the, the nodes are completely in a disordered way. Right. Who is your neighbor? The neighbor is somebody who can hear you. That's the definition of neighbor. I see. So, so consider the random, ge what's called, you know, sometimes random geometric graph, right? So you kind of connect, connect any two points which uh, distance are less than communication distance, right? And, you know, if the points are connected, you call them neighbors. So in an ideal plane, there would be a, s there would be a disk of neighbors around each yeah, so this is right. This is what is called random, random geometric graph. So you know, around each node, you put a disk mm -hmm. and connect it to all nodes within this disk. Right, so, what if some, something wrong happened to your seed? I saw your pictures. Uh, right, the, the seed should be protected. Ah, okay. Again, seed. the seed should be protected. Once again, you, if you remember, there is a periodic no motion, right? So, kind of everything is self uh, perpetuating, but the seed should be protected because uh, you know, if you take out the seed. Uh, there is no, no 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 way to I mean there might be sort of there, there, there might be some kind of uh, natural seed being formed nearby, but uh, in principle it might you're absolutely right that's a good point. Thank you. So, so so you can end up somewhere in the middle of the network with a natural seed. Not, not right, an right. It one. might happen, yeah. A and it's not gonna mess up. The well, it will be just a natural seed. It will also generate these waves for you. Again, it doesn't have kind of, remember I was talking about the exponential, so the, the graphs I was showing you, like in the beginning, it was with eight, eight colors uh, where the natural seeds are appearing. Then we switched to 12 colors, and the natural seeds just don't appear just because, again, the exponential decay of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the frequency. So the natural seeds are much, kind of, you increase just a little bit number of st internal states, and the natural seeds are just not there. So it's... Uh,
Any other questions? Well, if not, let's thank our speaker again.